So all teams are used to tracking the progress of their projects, right? But it's a little less usual to have an ex-Marine on your team to help you track that progress. Having one of your prototypes get away from you and head off across the countryside when it's the size of a bus, even less normal. Saying, thank God we have that ex-Marine so he can chase it down and take it down with a Bowie knife? <laughs> Memorable. <laughs> it sounds funny if you're not part of the Project Loon team at Google X, <laughs> but it was an uncomfortable event for them. Uh, we now tie down our balloons as we're inflating them. <laughs> but making all things being equal, making hardware is just harder than making software-only kinds of things. You need a wider diversity of skills, and you have to spend longer, you have to spend more money. And because the time to th from thinking of an idea to testing it and learning and repeating, that loop is the inner loop, it's the rate-limiting step on innovation, and that's slower in hardware. Given all of that, and given that Google is one of the world's most iconically software-oriented companies, why would they create Google X, a place dedicated to making physical products and services? So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. The simplest answer is that Google is already overflowing with incredibly creative, bright groups already working on lots of the software problems of the world. If Google X were doing that also, I'm not sure how much we would really be moving the needle. So if we want to help Google become something meaningfully different in the future, then that was more likely to happen if we focus on the physical world instead. And that by itself would justify Google X's focus on being physically situated in the things that we make and making sure that the things that we make, the systems that we build, have to survive contact with the physical world in some non-trivial way. But there's a deeper reason. We say that we're in the business of making moonshots. And by that we mean finding, and then hopefully over time solving, really huge problems in the world. And doing that via radical technology solutions. Most of the world's really pressing problems, though, are physical in nature and require physical solutions. So if we wanted to fix the clean water problem, if anyone wanted to fix the clean water problem and wanted to go after that using just software, I wouldn't give them great odds because it's just an inherently physical problem. If you want to take on grid-scale energy storage so that renewable energy can really take off, it's such a physical thing. If software is the only thing in your bag of tools, again, I'm not going to give great odds for success there. There are just a lot of these problems that are basically physical things and require physical systems in order to solve them. And the same thing is true for transportation, for agriculture, for manufacturing, for telecom infrastructure, for healthcare. There's another reason why Google X is focused on physical things, which is the opportunity for green fields for exploration. So as the people in this room are particularly sensitive to, I'm willing to bet, there's a ton of pressure on software businesses these days, on any business these days of any size, to be software focused because it allows you to explore faster and cheaper, and then if you find a solution to any problem, you can scale it up faster and cheaper and usually more lucratively in the end because you don't have a lot of variable costs that are non-zero. So, that tends to drive all of these businesses to solving fairly quickly all the problems that are amenable to being solved by software and leaves the problems that are not amenable to being solved by software-only solutions relatively undersolved 
and underexplored. If you want to go solve a problem in the world that people have so far been unsuccessful at solving, planning to be smarter than them, planning to have more money than them, planning to work harder than them, these are not really great plans. The right plan is go look somewhere they didn't even bother looking. So one of the reasons that Google X is focused on the physical world is because that just, that bias tends to drag us into explorations where people have done less exploration in the past, and that by itself gives us this sort of surprising boost in opportunities to find solutions, at least potential solutions, to really big, hard, interesting problems. Another thing that I've seen going on is what I think of as the half and half problem. It's um, sort of arbitrary, but if you're presented with a problem to solve and you don't know ahead of time what the solution is, just all things being equal, let's say very simplistically that half of the constraints and the assumptions around that problem are, whether you know it or not, are physical in nature and half of them are more algorithmic or data-oriented in nature. If your team is determined from the beginning only to break the assumptions, which are software only, you have given up from the beginning half of the opportunities to win because most real breakthroughs, fundamentally, and any problem-solving exercise, are about discovering one or two assumptions or constraints that everyone had perceived the space to be, that by breaking those assumptions, those constraints, you have taken a problem that didn't look solvable and turned it into one that at least might be solvable. But if you've taken off the table from the beginning because you don't have the skills, because you're not committed to the physical things, to doing those physical things, you just took down by a factor two your chances of finding a solution. So, um, one of the things I think we're going to see in the evolution of physical systems over time is a switch from the kind of mechanical thinking of the 20th century as a way of solving problems, the sort of foundational way of solving problems. I think of this as the civil engineering mentality, which has built itself into everything in our lives, not just the bridges in our lives. So cars, for example, smart as they are, still fundamentally are built around this mechanical way of thinking. And I believe that in the end, what we're going to see is that more and more strength, flexibility, safety, durability is going to be driven not by improving the mechanics of the system, but by embedding intelligence in the system, which is a physical system where the hardware and software are increasingly married in interesting and uh, productive ways. So Project Loon is a great example of this. If you want a balloon that just sort of hangs over San Francisco and helps um, create internet connectivity, you can't have it. You can't have that balloon stay there because the winds are too strong and you can't fight the winds. There's not enough energy up there to fight the winds. That would be a mechanical way to think about solving the problem. But if instead you allow the balloons, which is what Loon is doing, to go up and down, to pick winds of different directions and speeds, and by picking those different winds to sail with the winds, then all together they can take advantage by flocking behavior of what no one of them could do. So you can think of a virtual balloon staying still over a particular place on the Earth, even though no one balloon is staying there. That's embedded intelligence. Another example, one of my favorite examples, is uh, Makani, there's a wing out there, this is one of the Google X projects, and it's the Airborne Wind Turbine Project. This is explicitly a trade of three or 400 tons of steel being swapped out of the equation in exchange for an incredibly hard control systems problem. But what a wonderful trade-off that is, because steel isn't getting lighter very quickly, it's not getting cheaper very quickly, but control systems are roughly following Moore's law. Awesome trade. I think we're going to see, it's, it's, we're systems builders at Google X. We're not just obsessed with the hardware for the hardware's sake. But I think we're going to see more and more of a tighter and tighter loop between these, kind, these two kinds of things. 
So one way to see the intimacy of this loop is I predict that in order to keep Moore's law going, we are going to have to break out of the silicon only mode that we are still pretty much in. Now, I don't know if that's going to be optical computing, or we go backwards to analog computing, or DNA computing, or quantum computing. I, none of the things I've seen yet are really ready for prime time. But whatever it is, I'll bet you that the Orb the, ch the wall that we've built between hardware and software, for good reasons, for abstraction reasons, is going to come down and we'll get a lot more intimate, at least for a little while. These are things that Google X is not working on right now, but I think, you know, uh, synthetic life is a good example where you can now rewrite the DNA, put it in a cell, and boot up the cell to have new behaviors that had never occurred before in nature. And you know, the DNA is like software, but it's physical, and the cells are like the hardware that's running that software, except they can copy and paste themselves, which is sort of like software. Um, I think there's some really exciting stuff coming with uh, 3D printing, where we're going to see the ability to actually close the loop, to make something physical, then test it, automated with no humans in the loop, make a thing, test a thing in real world environments for which we don't have good simulators, take data about how it did in the world, then improve the design using software, and then close the loop by making a new, hopefully better thing, and drive that loop to get products that, or, that solve problems in the world that we hadn't actually known what the right answer was. We can hill climb in physical space. I predict we're going to see more of that. Let me give you um, one other thought about uh, from the self-driving car world. We had this problem with the cars a little while back where when a bicycle was in the bicycle lane on the wrong side coming towards us, so it was going the wrong way in the bicycle lane, the cars were kind of in a bit of a jam because generally when you see a bike in the lane on your side, the thing to expect is that it will be away from you in the next moment. But we as humans know that the physical, into, the physical momentum of the bicycle trumps that very reasonable generalization about what will happen. And now we've taught that to the cars and they understand that, but we had to teach that to them. And I think the takeaway is you have to build physical things. If you want to solve a problem in the physical world, you have to build physical things and test them in the real world. So I'll leave you with something I encourage the people at Google X to do all the time. Find some fun way to get a little bit more oil on your hands or mud on your boots. Just doing that, even if you don't know why at the beginning, you'd be surprised. Sometimes that's what it takes to take down some of the really big problems. Thank you very much.